Welcome to this special Biomimicry Fireside Chat. I'm Lex Amore with the Biomimicry Institute, and I'm grateful to greet you all here today for the land of the Kanaka O'ivi people on the island of Maui. It's with great respect that I honor the ancestors here and this Aina. Today's conversation is going to look at nature as model, nature as measure, and nature as mentor as we hear from the matriarch of the biomimicry movement, a woman who needs no formal introduction, as you all know her very well by now, here to offer wisdom and guidance as we reflect on the last 25 years and look ahead to the next quarter century of nature-inspired design. I am so honored to welcome Janine Benyus. Janine, thank you for being with us here today. Absolutely, Lex. This is awesome. Lovely, lovely thing. I have this dream, though, that uh, someday we'll gather uh, the biomimicry community on to a non-conference, just on a beach somewhere or in a national forest, and we'll camp, we'll have bonfires, and we'll talk about the future. Um, but for now, I'm really glad to, to that you all are spending some time with us. Yes, that is the dream. We will get there. Who knows? 2023. We, we'll, we'll get there. That's yeah. Yeah. COVID is hopefully in our rearview mirror mostly. So anyway, so that's what I'm hoping. Um, but I understand that you've got, there's a little surprise. Uh, Lex has been inviting you guys to do videos and I've been watching some of them and just you know tearing up and clapping and just amazing um but there's I haven't seen this compilation so um just this is about you guys uh the book is the book was the first just the first start and and uh it's about the community now so let's hear from them Lex yes. can, you, can you roll that I can't wait let's do it when people ask me if I am an optimist about our future in this planet, I always say yes, because of biomimicry. That was a major, major transformation for me. When I began to see nature as a library, rather than just as material that could be used just for satisfying human greed or just as a transactional thing, uh, for human satisfaction. We are a part of nature, not apart from nature. From there, everything changed because once that you get into reconnection, you see things differently. So it really helped me to, to find this kind of universal communication language that could be interdisciplinary and that is related to biology. As we all know, with the way that society has been for a while, we as a people can sometimes forget that we too are big part of nature. It really has shifted things for me from a place of helplessness and climate grief and loss. But now I feel like there's such potential and possibility if we just look around and truly experience the sense of belonging. And I think that's one of the parts of the secret sauce for biomimicry is that when you do this, it activates so many aspects of your being, of your interests. It was just an immediate homecoming for me. I just felt that this was absolutely a huge alignment of my passion and my purpose. And it really fostered a love of nature and um, it made me feel like I belonged, even if certain elements of society and my education made me feel kind of alone. So now I look to nature for solutions all the time because I am so um, ingratiated by it. I actually feel an incredible amount of relief. I am so glad not to have to pretend uh, that I have to have any of the answers, but rather that I can connect to nature, reconnect to what's really our birthright, our collective birthright, and learn from there. I honestly feel like the luckiest person in the world to get to do what I do. I'm so proud to be involved with biomimicry. Practicing biomimicry and introducing others to this incredible field has been life-changing for me. When we tune in to our curiosity and learn from the natural world, we become more connected with those around us and all of the organisms that we share this planet with. We can begin to relearn that no matter what barriers divide us, 
or how disconnected we are from the world around us. We are all so intricately interconnected. Biomimicry has changed the way I see things because I never really took, I never really looked at nature in depth as I have in the past year. For me, biomimicry is more than a professional influence. It's something that has meant so much to my entire family. And as someone with a young family, my hope for the future of biomimicry is, is simply the, the hope for the future of humanity, uh, of innovation, of technology, of design, that we realize the answers that we seek are all around us. When I was introduced to biomimicry, I thought, wow, this is really great just to get kids in nature. That's the first step. Just get them outside. It's changed my teaching um, and it's changed their learning. Biomimicry has actually totally changed my life. Since I started learning about it, I got even more and more curious. But it's not just me who's getting more curious. It's also when I teach it to the students, they are also becoming more curious. The way that biomimicry has changed the way that I think can work is that it's provided another place for solutions, the common challenges that we're faced with. I am motivated to do the work we do every day because we are helping to shift our human species away from extractive industries and extractive practices. This is one of the most rewarding things in my life because my job, my career is centered around seeking genius ideas from the natural world, learning how to speak the language of nature. Biomimicry made me realize that we need to make life-centric designs. It's given me a new lens to look at things. We want to demonstrate, we want to show that biomimicry is a viable path for a regenerative world. There are many situations where people actually find the problem but they are not able to come up with a solution. You know where to live, that's out there. How can we design factories that function like a forest? Um, how can we create design cities that um, seamlessly fit into nature, not just aesthetically, but also functionally? I am filled with gratitude and hope because I know that there are thousands of us working across the globe to create more regenerative solutions. Being part of this magical community gives me happiness. What is really special to me is all the wonderful people I got to meet through doing biomimicry. Because it's such a diverse group that is really hardworking and hopeful trying to make this world a better place. This incredible community of so many different people from so many different places in the world are finding ways to make it practical and relevant. We can finally learn to come home to this planet, to fit in here at last and for good on this home that is ours, but not ours alone. So join us. I don't know what was better, watching that amazing video again because of just how inspiring it is to see how many people are doing this or watching your face watching the video. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know so many people, you know, it's like being at a wedding and having people come up to you and you're like, oh, I remember you from this workshop and, and this learning, uh, this cohort and gosh, this network, global network. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And to have started, you know, happy birthday, I mean, happy anniversary. Um, to this book. I mean, it's amazing that, you know, you start this thing, you start, you start alone <laughs> writing a book. It's kind of a lonely thing. Um, and many times I, I had a, a, a big sense that I was, you know, I would tell Laura, I'm make, am I making this up? Why isn't this better known? Right. And, um, but then, you know, then what happens is that that, that meme which is basically an adaptive gene, you know, that spreads in a population. Um, it acquires people. It acquired me. And then, you know, then the community, the first community were the people I met in the book, the biomimics. You know, I went to, I, for the first time, my sixth book, I actually did interviews with people and, and hung out with them. And uh, I guess that was the first, that was the start of community. Tell us, tell us more about that. I mean, we're talking about in a life's principle in biomimicry and how nature self-organizes what what does nature teach us about self-organizing from the bottom up and those origins of how you got started 
You know, it, it's really been amazing to watch this, you know, because it's 25 years. I started collecting in 1990, so it was, I've been watching it for a long time. And it has self-organized from the bottom up. And so one of the things life does is find ways to handle flow, mm -hmm. form follows flow, right? And so flow of anything, you know, so in this case, you know, it was the flow of, of all these great ideas from the natural world. And um, we have been basically creating structures, flow structures, to allow these beautiful ideas to come from the natural world into human systems design. And it started, you know, Dana Baumeister knocked on my door in 1998. Uh, we started the guild, we started a consultancy, but she had just read the book and she was the part of this growing community. She said, I want to, I want to do this. And I was like, do what, you know, and we, we sat for I don't know, the story changes 11 hours, 14 hours. It was a long time. Laura was feeding and watering us. And we basically came up with sort of what this field, you know, might, how we might serve it, basically. And we came up with this apt organic metaphor, which was a flow structure, like your, your veins and your arteries are flow structures. And, the, you know, the phloem and the, the capillary tubes and trees and branches and they're flow structures. They get things, nutrients to where they need to go. And life is full of these flow structures and that, and they self-organize in response to what's, you know, okay, how do we gracefully handle the new flow? And what was happening at that time is that all these companies were actually calling me. I was a writer. They were calling me and saying, you know, would you bring your biologist to the design table? And so that was the flow. And Dana and I started to create this flow structure, you know, which was this self-organized consultancy. And there were all these people that would come and call us and say, I want to do a film or I want to teach K through 12. And so we didn't have an organization, she and I. I mean, we hadn't started the guild yet. And we just called people or wrote to them, emailed them and said, you know, if you want to come to Montana, we did one in, we did these gatherings, um, Arizona, uh, Kansas, and Montana. And we would say, you know, if you want to come, come and we'll talk about what to do with this emerging discipline. And they all came. And it was amazing. It was like David Oki, the designer, and, you know, Pax Scientific, Jay Harmon, and all these people that were Jeremy Flutie and these RMI folks, and just anybody who had an interest who were, was attracted to the flame of this idea. And, you know, in the third gathering, we said, well, it looks like there's this flow of, you know, we keep getting like people wanting us to help them with their eighth grade homework. And maybe it's time, you know, to, to democratize this and send it out. And, and that's when Brian E. Schwann was at that gathering. And we decided, the community said, we should have a nonprofit. And that was the beginning of the Biomimicry Institute. And she stepped up and said, well, I'll help you get it started. And um, yeah, yeah. So that's, and it's happened. So we've been responding, right? And it's in the word movement, yeah. right? It's flow. It's just, and so you, so life self-organizes to meet this, to meet, if there's a really energetic flow to gracefully handle it, it'll self-organize new new roots networks or new my, mycelial networks, right? And that's, you know, and so every time that um, there was more interest, we created more things. So Dana and I would create these workshops and first they were a week. And then, you know, now she's, she teaches at the Center for Biomimicry. She teaches a two-year master course and online course, um, an in-person certificate, biomimicry professional certificate, hundreds and hundreds of people are going through these programs. Um, you know, at the Institute, when we had all this, we were gathering all this information about biological strategies, because we were in a consultancy. Um, and we thought, no, the world needs to know about this. This is a flow that we need to get out. And that's how Ask Nature started. <laughs> right? 
or like, let's put up a website and get this out, get this out to the world. And let's start the Biomimicry Educators Network, 10,000 teachers. And let's, it was just us trying to sort of create a home. You know, you can think of a flow structure or a home for, for this burgeoning uh, group of people. And, you know, you've been working now with the, with, you know, with the networks and bringing on, tell folks about the networks and how many there are now. It's incredible. I mean, some of the things, I, I think we've all felt this in inclusiveness and from the origin story, it's so clear that that was an intention and being able to create this model where you can share it with the world so that they get to see themselves and then they get to grow it. It's, it's amazing. And between Ask Nature, yes, having all of these solutions and it's your go-to place to learn and connect and figure out some of these solutions. But to even think that now we have gone from youth education all the way to startups and really bringing markets to these innovations that are so needed at time right now. And through our Ray of Hope Cries, we do that. Uh, we work with universities through the launch pad. But one of the, it's been such an honor to be able to connect with the networks on this depth. And when we relaunched it at the end of last year, we really wanted a clean start because some people had been active and you know some had been doing amazing work. Others were trying to merge together. And so we were, let's see what the landscape is now. And what that offered was, is now we have 36 official global network groups spanning 26 countries, but we also have thousands more practitioners, educators, designers out in the world, which, which is why this campaign of bringing everyone together and having them share their work is, it's just so inspiring and so incredible. And honestly, it helps me sleep better at night because I know that it's on all of us to come together and to figure out where our point of interest is and how we can solve a challenge that's close to us. And I know that you've been, you've been flying over this landscape back when you said, you know, back in 1990 when you started, but you know, let's be real, your connection to nature started long before that, yeah. but you've been following this story. You're, you're really a cultural commentator, you know, been here from the beginning and from even when there was only a small handful of known case studies. What do you see happening now on the reach of biomimicry? Oh my gosh. It's, it is so incredible. Really it is. It's, um, you know, when, when we, I mean, now we have this global consultancy biomimicry 3.8 for 3.8 billion years. And we're working with amazing people in product design and all the way up to the design of cities and built world, you know, Ford, Microsoft, Google, Interface, Kohler. I mean, these, you know, these are, in fact, Microsoft just named a biomimicry professional, Caitlin, um, to be the director of biomimicry. And Jamie Miller, who started Biomimicry Frontiers up in Canada and worked with the OCAD uh, team, uh, he just got hired by a big um, b &H, I think it is, the, the mm -hmm. uh, architecture firm, about a 500 person architecture firm. He's the director of biomimicry. Director of biomimicry. biomimicry. That's a thing now, people. A thing. And, and, and we, I, you know, Dana, Dana and I, I think, really had this unshakable faith that um, this made so much sense. Where we were, you know, in the environmental movement, We'd been, you know, swimming around in the problem space for a long time. We had a stranglehold on the problem space. Everybody was studying it, you know, and and then the answer was sustainability. We moved into the sustainability movement, um, but but believe me, you know, 25 years ago, when it was very unusual to imagine, you know, going into these corporations. We call it roller skating in the halls of power. Um, because we were biologists and why would you have a biologist at your design table? We first had to sort of explain that mm -hmm. to people. And now there's a, there's a pull that flow structure. Again, we were hoping that there would be a pull. So I think there's a demand now people know, I think people also, the world has gotten to the point where we've come right up to the unintended consequences, mm -hmm. right? 
of our actions. And we're in, you know, there's sirens going off all over with the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, social justice, just the democracy crisis. We know that this is not working. <laughs> and it was built on a machine model. It was built on, on a model that um, didn't acknowledge that we're actually a complex adaptive system. We're living system. And that therefore our companies are living systems in our communities and, and they need to be diverse, that that's their strength. And they're, they can't, they're really not predictable. <laughs> What you can do is create conditions conducive to life and life will self-organize, right? And, and we, we knew that as biologists, we knew that, um, but it was very, we had to create the language, the interface language, you know, to bring, to be the translators and know enough about the cultures we were walking into to have them see that, you know, and bring value to them, bring value. And, and I, now you look and, and the idea of acting like a living system and creating a condition, conditions in your company to be diverse and inclusive and make sure that people feel, have psychological safety and that they, you know, we're starting to realize that we're living beings, right? And that maybe we're not, you know, in red and tooth and claw competition, but maybe we're actually the super collaborators on the, you know, with human beings, the human species are, are collaborators. Um, that whole, that whole change, it's as if the, the world has now, you know, become, and we always, we always waited for this moment when the world would become ready to listen to nature's wisdom. We used to say to ourselves, let's make sure that we have the tools in place, the training in place, that when, when any inventor anywhere in the world turns and says, how would nature do this? That there's, some, that, there's, that there's an answer, that there's a way for them to go out into the natural world and interpret it um, without having to get a biology degree, right? There was a lot, and then and then we'd fill the we'd fill the design tables, you know, the architecture and design and chemistry labs with biomimics, right? We just had these really amazingly huge beliefs, you know, and I think and then you know, in one of the one of the things we also said. You know, when, when you think about how to grow good things and how to get things to scale, you know, we look backwards now and go, huh, what were some of the things that were biomimetic about what we did? And we didn't, one of the things was that we didn't hold on too tightly. We actually trained, I mean, people would say to us in business consultants would say, now you've got a consultancy, but part of it is training people to be consultants and do what you do. And we're like, yeah, because we realized that the world, you know, was huge and in great need. And that the design, that the, the wisdom from the natural world was so abundant that it needed a lot of flow structures, right? It needed everybody. You know, we, we said, we're gonna, we're gonna localize it globally, you know, because who are we to say how, how to do biomimicry in Croatia? Biomimicry Croatia knows, that network knows, right? So we, we were like, how, well, we'll try to serve you and we'll showcase you. Maybe, you know, one of the things we did was, um, and I think people ask me, what are, what are you proudest of? And I think looking back, it's putting ethics, putting mm -hmm. those, you know, we, do, we talk about nature as, as model. Mm -hmm. Um, which is the emulate piece, you know, where we worked with designers and engineers and now we're working in social innovation, you know, working with companies and helping them create collaboration models based on the natural world. Those, that's, that nature as model. Um, the thing that we did to make sure that it was deep biomimicry was that we also included nature as measure. That became this you know, the standard, we took our standards from the natural world and nature's mentor. 
And so there was this continuing like teach people how to reconnect. I mean, what, and you know, when I say that I'm talking, it's a, re, it's a remedial practice for Western industrial culture. Indigenous peoples have been doing this for a very, very long time. Yes. Their flow structure was not disconnected, right? And ours, ours we, we dismembered and now we're remembering. Mm. Yes. And we're trying, that's the reconnect piece. So we have these three pieces in biomimicry, you know, the emulate, the reconnect. And then the ethos was, you know, the, the, the understanding that we're a very young species, <laughs> toddlers with matches, smart, big brains on those toddlers, but we wanted some, we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to fall in and make the same mistakes, mm -hmm. right? And, and have this gold rush to biomimicry without, without any ethos. So where we look for ethics in the natural world is the natural world, right? We look at what are the common patterns and that became, that was life's principles. Mm -hmm. So life's principles are these common patterns. What do, what do we see over and over again in the natural world? And they're, you know, they're big things like, you know, cultivating cooperative relationships and, you know, and doing chemistry and life-friendly conditions. Um, they're actually quite ambitious. And that we use them as the filter of whether or not our designs were, um, were truly biomimetic. Mm -hmm. Having that as the aspiration and the evaluation is so important and gives us a framework. But what I love that you're also touching on here is the importance of context and how biomimicry as a perspective is, it's giving you the tools to ask the right kinds of questions. And there's this beautiful humility that comes out of it that says, you don't have to have all the answers. You just have to know how to ask the right kinds of questions. And I know we were, you know, we're talking about nature as model, nature as measure, nature as mentor. I'd, I'd love to go back to be the beginning before you were able to incorporate measure and mentor. What did nature as model mean at the beginning? And then how did it kind of evolve into getting, like, how did you start to see that, that flow of how we needed to think a little bit bigger beyond? Yeah, well, you know, when you you put yourself back 25 years in a nascent uh, sustainability movement, right, where people were basically just saying, let's just make the building airtight so that we can reduce energy use. Mm -hmm. That was the that was that was what good design was at that point, mm -hmm. and that was really wild, crazy green design. Um, and so, and so the world was still, I mean, the, the building was still created with incredibly toxic materials, mm -hmm. right? And it was, you know, things were made in sweatshops and trucked across the globe and still are in many cases, but this is before there was fair trade. I mean, just think about where the movement, the environmental and sustainability movement was. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first, it was a triage. The first thing was let's get nature's um, models of chemistry, um, efficient drag reduction. Um, let's, let's teach people how to shave material use, sip energy and get toxins out of our products. I mean, there was this, and there still is. I mean, none of this goes away. It's not like you do this sequential thing. You, you just, you just bring in these different flow, flows, right? Mm -hmm. as, as the world is ready for them, frankly. If we had come in and said, you, nature needs to be your mentor, you meet people where they are. And where they are is they're, they, they're realizing that they're starting to get some environmental regulations. The, the things that were passed in the 70s are starting to catch up with them. The Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. There wasn't director of sustainability in that at that time. You know, we were working in the R and D labs, and so that's that's where that started. And the, you know, the, in in the and the academics were very really doing an incredible amount of of work. Um, you know, 
if you look, I, I, I want to tell you about some, some numbers. Um, and many of these are about nature as model, whether mm -hmm. it's modeling form, process, or ecosystem. When I started, you know, there wasn't a thing called Google. I think it was called Ask. Yeah, Ask. And, or something like that, is search engines. But you would type in, you know, the biomimicry and its synonyms, which are biomimetics, biomimetic, biologically inspired, bio-inspired, um, bio and, and um, yeah, and the bit, and the bit. Uh, biomimetics. That's what I put in. I put it yesterday. I put these in <laughs> into search engines. You ready? 94.3 million hits on Google. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> then I went to Google Scholar, which holds the a lot, you know, the, the scientific papers. 98,000 with those B words in the title. 98,000 hits, 98,000 papers within the title. Wow. Um, and then when you do a full text search with Google Scholar, it's 1.5 million papers. That's amazing. <laughs> right, and so this is, you know, nature's model is really getting going. Um, on Amazon books, there are 834 Amazon books with that, with those wow. uh, biomimicry and its synonyms in the title, 834. 83 books with biomimicry in the title. And this is just in the title. We're not even talking about supporting research no, and no, that's contributing but, articles. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. 135,800 patents. And that have it in somewhere in the patent, those terms. But in the title and abstract, 7,332. Wow. So with the networks that you're talking about, um, and we, this is just, you know, you got to think of biomimicry as this huge sprawling network and we're one pulsing node, the Institute, and we're connected. We're lucky enough to be connected to a lot of other groups that are pulsing and they're connected to group. I mean, there's, you know, this, this world here, you know, there were, there are 1500 theses, doctoral theses. It's with amazing. biomimicry and it's yeah. So anyway, it's 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 amazing, and you know, not all of this came because of this book. Believe right. me. I mean, what I did as a cultural commentator is basically see this really faint signal in the mm -hmm. literature, right? And then all of a sudden, I had, you know, I had a complete filing cabinet of Xerox articles about something that didn't have a name didn't have a single name. You know, the material scientists called it biomimetics and natural systems agriculture is what the Land Institute called it. They all had different names. There wasn't really a, a flow structure for their stories. The book was that. It was, it was for their stories to get put between two covers and go, hey world, this is, this is, this is happening. Yeah. And so and it really I really started as a, a catalyst too, right? I mean, it's yes, it it, it catapulted the the guild, Biomimicry 3.8, the institute. And but what we can also do is now as part of our mission, we have our individual programs where we help you know youth educators and startups and obviously ask nature, but we're we want to serve as a platform and to help now shine a light and offer this momentum that is wherever you came into this practice, now you have a home that can have these people that are all here together, gathering and sharing the, the same kinds of thoughts and perspectives and encouraging each other. It's, it is inspiring. And it's something that, you know, you're talking about all these numbers, these incredible momentum that's happening. And as we started with nature as model, and you moved into this concept of nature as measure and this idea of generous design, I'm oh, yeah. curious now how you're seeing that now fold into this kind of research and, and are people embodying that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I had a quote from Vaclav Havel, who was the president of Czechoslovakia. Um, 
and he said, we should take our standards from the natural world. That's how I opened the book. It's really interesting. And so nature as measure was really, in, really important to me. It was like, that's our gold standard or green standard or whatever you want, our emerald standard. Um, and that should be what we aspire to because we are nature, <laughs> you know? Um, we're young and we're, we're kind of maladapted right now, but to be well adapted is to sort of see that as your reference mm. you want it that you really want you, you look up to that's your mentor that you want to become and so how do you make that real that's what we also have done constantly in all of our organizations is try to make th these these dreams real and so nature's measure right now um seth was talking about um in his video uh, seth Gal galrick was talking about um the Project Positive, uh, where we have Ford and Microsoft and Google. This is through the consultancy. But a lot of people are starting to do this generous design. And what it is, is it's basically uh, you have a city or a building or a factory. Uh, factory is for us. That's the term. Um, and you basically look at the ecosystem that would be there if you weren't there. Right. And you take your standards from that. We measure it and we look at how much water is being stored per acre and how much or hectare, how much water, how much soil is being built, how much nutrients cycled, wildlife supported, carbon sequestered, right? Not just energy, but all of these e ecological benefits that are happening right next door. And we say, can we do that with our building and our site? Well, that's an aspirational goal. That's nature as measure because it's local. So if you're doing it in Phoenix, it's gonna be very different. You're gonna go out to the Saguaro cactus and you're gonna be, you know, that, that ecosystem and go, wow, look at how they're using water, storing water, right? So then what you do is once you have those metrics, you do go out into those places. If you're in a, you're, you're in a, a tropical rainforest area, you go and you say, how is this system purging itself of water after very heavy rains, right? And you, and you put that into your, um, into your building design. And again, it's about flows. You are hoping that just like a natural ecosystem that has all these beneficial flows, I'm looking at the wilderness right now, I'm up against my, in Western Montana and out comes these beneficial flows for free to me, right? And the toddler would just take them. But as we now grow up as a species, what do we give back? That's nature as measure. It's a, it's a hard one. Yeah. But it's also, it's where we need to go next. Not net zero, let's zoom by that. We need to get to net zero, you know, no, no harm. But then what's the positives that we're given back? And we, again, an ecosystem, a local ecosystem is going to teach mm -hmm. you how to do that. Yes. I'm coming back to this idea of regeneration. And I, I think it's so yeah. fascinating because you, we talked earlier about how people were stuck in understanding what the problem is for a very long time, which is good because we need to understand what kind of problems we're working with. But at the same time, now that we're finally in this solution space and we're seeing it across the board where people are moving from yes, sustainability, but also regeneration. And more people throughout, not just those numbers, but we're seeing it also companies. It's, it's, in, it's insane. They're infusing these kinds of nature-inspired strategies and business technology processes, systems. I'm, I'd love to hear what are a couple designs that give you hope that are really embodying this kind of form of measurement that you help maybe could you know, further the awareness of this kind of work, like really good case studies. Well, you know, the, for the project positive stuff, I mean, you can imagine it's going to be a very lush and lovely place to live because where you're going to be, if you want to cool an area you're going to be you're going to you know now you have your factory and your parking lot you know we work with interface and it's hot it doesn't look any it doesn't feel anything like the forest next door right so you're going to put out these maybe you're going to do solar awnings as well as trees right and you're going to have green roofs and blue roofs and 
you're not going to have pavement. You're going to have permeable pavements because you have to store, you have now a new metric. You have to store enough water, right? And you're going to, you want to, th that forest next door filters air and it cleans it of pollutants. So you're going to want, with your walls, with every surface area you have, you may want to put up some phytoremediation. And these are all, you know, things that they're starting to do. And, it, and when you design in this way and you realize, wow, I, I would really love to, you know, cycle more nutrients or I would like to support wildlife. Um, we say, okay, there's ways you can, you can do habit texture. You can create niches in your buildings, places that are, are actually great breeding zones. Right. It's that sort of stuff that we're doing. So it turns it then turns into, um, you know, a design that's mm -hmm. systemic in nature. And that looks at, you know, I mean, food, growing food, providing food is an ecosystem service or an ecological benefit. So maybe there's a garden on the roof. And then as long as you're at it, you might as well support pollinators. So maybe there's native bee, you know, so that's the thing. It's like these cascading benefits, right, um, that come from that. And I, you know, I see, I see design moving. You're absolutely right. We're in the solution space. That's what biomimicry is. <laughs> it's finding those solutions with nature's help and the rest of nature. But I see it in our um, design. We have amazing design challenges. And we have this uh, at the Institute, we have this Ray of Hope Prize. And uh, it's, it's, RC, um, it's RC Anderson, uh, Ray, Ray C. Anderson Foundation gives us $100,000 uh, reward for the best. And then we have some second and third. These are for startups, biomimic, best biomimicry startups uh, every year. And, um, and then they get a lot of, of coaching about, mm -hmm. you know, we give them a lot of help with um, sustainability tools and metrics and LCAs and science know, communication, getting them connected to investors, create some really cool media tools. Stay tuned, everyone, cool. for the fall. It's very cool. And I'm, I'm amazed. Like the first year we did it, we had 139 applicants from something like 41 countries. These are, these are new biomimicry startups. And so those startups, also look at life's principles with us. Mm -hmm. So what we wind up having is like, you've got, uh, there was one called um, Oh Muscle Polymers. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so many of these are dreams come true for me. So Herb Waite in the book was talking about muscle glue, right? So these, this company has figured out how to make it in a complete, how to mimic that, the way a muscle holds itself with its hold fast. Um, underwater, lose itself underwater. And they figured out how to, how to do that in a non-toxic way. So there's the mimicry of process. They're mimicking the process. But then what are they, what is their first application? Mm -hmm. Their first application is coral reef restoration because obviously we're losing so many. So imagine these bleached coral reefs. So there's people that are growing heat adapted um, corals and they have to glue them to the, to the dying coral and they're being glued now with toxic epoxy. So their first application, it's, it came from the ocean and their first application is to help in the ocean. And that is a, that's a systems thinking. I mean, they could have gone into and they will eventually, you know, helping boats heal so they don't have to be dry docked to get work done and things like that and biomedical stuff for inside your body. But the first thing is the corals mm -hmm. and that's a deeper biomimicry. And that actually and is a great segue into how we're talking about nature as mentor. This, mm -hmm. the, where the ethos grows deeper and our reconnect elements shine. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about these integral pieces and how they complete this approach of the systems perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the question we always ask ourselves, you know, for nature's model is what would nature do here? 
nature's measure, it's also what wouldn't nature do here? And then why and why not? We ask that, like, there, there's a deepening, as Wes Jackson would call it, a deepening conversation with the organism. You go back again and again and say, okay, I, I have these mechanisms that I've learned. And now I see how this, you know, it's, it's this, this, you know, and you have to do this when you're making something, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to use the bumps of uh, that humpback whale, the tubercles concept on a wind turbine. But then you have to ask yourself, what materials are you using and how are you making the wind turbine and how is it going to be integrated into the marketing eco ecosystem and who's going to make it who's where where are the money flow is going to go and who's going to benefit those things are ecosystem level why and why not questions where you you spend enough time learning from the natural world to understand why things are done the way they're done yeah. or why some things are not done Right. And that, that love, and you know, that's something that indigenous communities, I mean, there's a reason I started with Mao, um, who's an indigenous man. I started the book with an indigenous man named Mao, who was fighting for the Haroni, uh, his people. And he had to come into New York City, DC. He went to DC for the, for the first time. He was coming to a city. And he saw baseball for the first time. He'd had shower, you know, hot and cold showers, and he'd been on a plane for the first time. Can you imagine? And you know, he went into Congress. He testified in Congress for his people, and he roared like a jaguar in the test in, in the in the meetings. And when he was leaving, they said, hey, "What do you think? You know, of everything here?" And he said. Um, there's not much to learn here. It's time to walk in the forest again. Mm. It's time to, for me to walk in the forest again. So people who have lived in place, not for, you know, I've lived here in Montana on the same piece of land. My partner and I have been learning from this place for 32 years now. That's nothing, you know, for an indigenous community, they've, it's generational generational, generational, and the deep observation is nature's mentor. I mean, it's, it's not just how things are done. It's the relationships. That's how things are done, is really relationships. And, and then they're understanding year after year how, you know, how the adaptive cycle happens it's the kind of thing you only understand if you live in a place for a long long time and your people have lived there for a long time and that they've let that flow of the natural world and the, the wisdom the way things work there go through them right and and they honor that now we are remedial in that western industrial culture and so we take baby steps and we do a lot of reconnect. You know, so our workshops, are, our best workshops are outside. That's why Dana takes the biomimic, Dana and Toby teach the biomimicry professional um, certific certification. These are the leaders. Um, there's many of them on the call today. Um, they go out over a two year period, they do online courses and then they go out for six one week sessions all around the world, different places, different habitats, Peru and South Africa. And, Tanzania. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, it's the best way um, to really get to know a place is you have to be in it. It's a great place right. to start also for, for young people is just finding their place in the natural world. Yeah. So we've done that, you know, and you, I, somehow you were involved in that. I think the, when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. yeah, you were, you did that, didn't you? Lex, Lex. I've been watch, around. Watch, watch. <laughs> oh my God. So you should, yeah, the pandemic hit, we were all home. We looked out our window, we saw, even if we saw one tree in our, you know, on our city block, people who didn't see a tree on their city block noticed too. Yeah. And, but anyway, people went outside. A lot of people went outside. So you started this 30 days of reconnect mm -hmm. where people did nature journaling 
and it was based on the eyesight book. There's a great eyesight book by Erin Ravallo. I don't know if she's on the call. But anyway, um, reconnecting people in that way is where that's our baby steps is getting back, learning to observe. There's this whole book of eyesights, which, you know, we do in our, you know, they're, they're different, like structured um, exercises mm -hmm. to help you sit down, quiet your cleverness and listen in a deep observational way we're relearning that mm -hmm. and those guides are so helpful they really help us put the things into context but it's it's all about applied learning and it's crazy to think we've got 10 minutes left janine so <laughs> you are researching and writing your next book I know I, it's a resource for biomimics and I, I love the way that you organized the last book into questions, you know, how will we grow food, make our materials, run businesses. How did you choose the chapters you're focusing on for this book? Is it going to give us some insight into where you think the field is headed? You know, actually, yeah, I think, I think so. I think you know, I'm trying to be useful. Um, <laughs> just, I am really trying to be useful this um, to the community, to biomimics. It's a source book for biomimics. So, so this is a book about nature's universals. And it's these deep, deep patterns that we see in the natural world, not just physical patterns like Fibonacci, but sort of, it's a deep dive into how nature creates conditions conducive to life. Mm. And I did choose, and I've been collecting for about 10 years for this book. And it, because I have such incredibly able people, you know, on the teams that we work on, they're amazing. Nicole Miller running this Project Positive and what, B38 and, and Beth Ratner at the Institute and Dana, you know, it, it, it's amazing. So I said, can I go and do what I love? And they said, yeah, please go see, go read and see what you find. And so I've been, I've been looking for these nature's universals. And so then I had to create chapters. And I, like I said, I wanted to be useful. So I wanted to plug into the things that you guys are already working on out there, right? So the chapters, I'll go through the chapters because I think this is what we're gonna work on. This is my guess. I hope this is helpful. It's a complete biology book this time, but written so that you can actually use, you know, there'll be design principles at the end of every chapter that you can use. And, and I'll, I'll go and talk to people like I did with biomimicry, people with their hair on fire, um, who see these patterns everywhere. The first, um, one of the chapters is how does nature heal from trauma? Mm. So I look at I look at different scales. So I look at everything from you know a cut on your finger to Mount St. Helens blows up, wow. and who or, or the fires around here. I've got to gotten to watch this, watch the healing, and then there are people who study that. And so at all of those scales, like are there things that we that are in common about how nature heals? Because we need to be on the healing team now, as Dana calls them, healing team. Um, for this planet. We're not the hero, we're just the healing team. Uh, so it'll, so that's one. Um, one is, um, how does nature uh, learn and adapt? Um, because we're, and we're learning so much. I mean, that's the thing that science has come so far to help us understand learning both in humans, but also in the natural world. How, how does, how does this, how does life keep getting better and better and better over generations. Are there deep patterns and principles about how that, how the best, the best adaptations of how shall we live here, the best answers to that question of how shall we live here, get brought up and then get carried on and passed on and built onto. I find that fascinating. Um, there's a chapter on the circular economy I mean, I think people in doing, trying to do the chemistry of circular economy will appreciate it. It's, it's a book about, it's a chapter about how nature reincarnates mm. materials 
over and over and over again with this very simple subset of the periodic table put it put in with these fair lines and so that it can it's a lego set that can be easily taken apart and remade with you know catabolism and anabolism right it can be what we have to get directly into that into that flow um and uh so i'm looking for the patterns because people are starting to find these within the metabolic big crazy spaghetti chart of metabolic processes like the krebs cycle and citrix they're standing back and they're finding these motifs mm -hmm. that keep on repeating over and over and over again and they might be they might be a a guide to us yeah. um you know we're doing this thing at the the institute um is doing this uh design for decomposition mm -hmm. work where they're looking at um fashion the 92 million tons that mm -hmm. you know we make every year now most of it polyester uh, winds up in ghana um, and other places and and then the oceans you know not only nine percent of plastics get recycled really so what what happens to that other 91 percent mm -hmm. and how can we design our clothes so that they're a gift to soil. Yes. So that they build soil, right? So that's part of that circular economy. There's a chapter on um, how does nature self-organize for collective mm -hmm. action. There's a chapter on how does nature grow? You know, this idea that we're just, uh, that we need, our, we need to grow our economy to survive that's being questioned right yeah. now. It's <laughs> so incredible. Yeah, like I, I feel like I'm, I'm given renewed hope for more, so many reasons. And I know we're all like on pins and needles waiting for you to, to release this beautiful masterpiece into the world. And I also know you and I could talk for hours. Um, <laughs> we, I, I know that everyone here in ideal world, we're going to have that unconference, have everyone's faces. We're going to, end our chat today in a segment called thoughts in three. So three minutes, three questions. I'll, I'll ask you to try and answer as concise as possible. Oh, so God. the first one is, so Vicki Robbins, she helped pioneer the voluntary, um, voluntary simplicity movement. She's got a new podcast and I think you've got an episode coming out, Janine. So it's a great name. Yeah. And I'd like to ask you the question that she asked in the show's title, what could possibly go right? <laughs> yeah, it's a great, that's a great thought. I, I think we need to keep in, keep that in mind. What could possibly go right? Um, we could remember that we are nature mm -hmm. and that we could release uh, the lonely myth of um, human exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's let that go. Mm -hmm. Let's let that go. We could release um, the myth that was just a misreading of Darwin, just a misreading of science, that we that we are born to compete, mm. that we survive by competition. Competition is part of the natural world for sure, but it is by far, cooperation and collaboration is by far the strategy that almost every organism is involved in some sort of mutualism in its life sometimes hundreds of mutualisms throughout his yes. life. We need to, we need to release the myth. Mm. Right. I have a chapter on what shapes community that I hope will, will, will do some of that. We could release those myths. That's what could, could yeah. go right. We could I love that. Myth that is that powerful. We, and that we need to, we need to fight. We could. Yes. Release. Yeah. I love watch, it. Watch what's happening with Sweden and Finland and NATO and yeah, cooperation. Who's getting isolated right now? Amazing. Your second question. What is the best oh. piece of advice you've ever received? Mm. The best piece of advice. Um, it actually wasn't spoken to me, but I have pulled this out. And it was it's from Rachel Carson. Mm who is my total hero, like literally. 
I thought I was going to follow. She was a, you know, she was an editor in the in the government, and I was too at the Forest Service. And then she wrote her first book when she was fifty something. I thought that's what I'm going to do. You know, it, it happened differently, but um, she was my hero. It just she brought poetry into writing, and she allowed me to do that. In fact, she said, "You have to be. You have to write ecstatically if your subject is is ecstatic." right? As ecstatic as the earth is. So um, she let me do that, but she taught me to be fierce. Oof. Yes. She taught me to overcome, and by fierce, I mean, she overcame her timidity to do that which is necessary. Mm, that is powerful. I love it. Yep. And got I, one more. I did. Yeah. Oh, here we go. And I know we're at time. So if, Folks hanging on can stay with us just a few more minutes. What does it mean to join the biomimicry movement? What does it mean? You know, um, I myself was a very much a loner. And anybody who knows me pre-biomimicry can tell you, I did not like to be with more than two people in a room. I was pretty, I was, yeah, I was a writer and that was good. It has taught me that, um, you know, I kind of came for the idea for the meme and stayed for the people. The people in biomimicry are such, there's a quality about them, many qualities, but joy mm. um, at having found one another, similar nature nerds and joy in nature. The fact that they can find deep joy in nature. There's a kindness and a, a gentleness, whip smart, absolutely smart, smart, smart people too. But really, there's a gentle, gentle good humor yeah. that I see. And I mean, just after 25 years of groups that are attracted to this meme. So to join it, um, find a group of people locally. Um, and we've got all kinds of resources on the, on the web to you know, run a program, get, do a class, Paint out your part of the canvas. That's one of the things we did is just say, there's so much to do. Just do, and we'll we'll showcase it when when it when you do it. But we don't, we trust you. Yes. We trust you to know how to do it. You and and if we can help you with tools and you know, and ask nature and tell us, you know, we need this. Um, but we we are learning as much from you when you localize biomimicry in whatever profession you're in, you know, and whether you're an artist doing, doing nature inspired art or you're, you know, a chemist or you're bringing it into the automotive industry, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, you're gonna know best how to do that, right? Wow. Or you bring it into social innovation, you, you're gonna know and you come and tell us and we'll, we'll go, wow, nice. I like the part of the canvas you're painting out. Mm -hmm. I love that so much, Janine. I'm feeling the love from everyone here. I, it really is about all of us. Thank you for everyone for participating. Thank you, Janine, for being here, continuing. Everyone is contributing to the work from here. And it's, it's insane how much covered ground we've had today. I mean, the growth of this incredible movement, the impact it's happening on the world. I'm, I'm personally so passionate about this work and I'm honored to serve in this way. At the Biomimicry Institute this year is, it's super ambitious, probably our most ambitious yet. We've got a new team, new momentum for providing better support for youth educators and nature inspired innovators. Um, Ask Nature is growing, uh, adding more diverse perspectives. There's so much more, our, our work, couldn't be accomplished without the support from so many of the generous people around the world. And I'm actually super excited to announce that we received a generous new grant from the Dolores Bar Weaver Endowment Fund. And every dollar of support received between now and August 31st is gonna be matched up to $50,000, which is huge in helping us to address critical environmental and social challenges through biomimicry education for youth, innovators alike. So if you feel inspired to help us in this journey, please head over to biomimicry.org. Your support means the world to us. Janine, 
thank you for all of your wisdom and thank you everyone for being here today. We really couldn't do it without all of you. So go outside, reconnect with your place in nature and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Lex. Thank you. Talk soon, everyone. Aloha. See you on the beach. <laughs>